industry. And if you really want to see what the textile industry plans look like, all you have to do is go to New Bedford. And you can see condominiums, which I saw today, that were textile mills. How do I know they were textile mills? Not because I'm a scholar, but because I used to work for the Textile Workers Union. And the amalgam, which is now the, which was then the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. And I knew, I knew what industrial plants in the textile industry looked like. And New Bedford is one of the places where they were. But kids worked at the age of seven, kids worked at the age of eight, nine years old, and they did not have time, even though the legislatures had established public schools as mandatory. The mandatory nature of public schools was a phenomenon that followed several different factors. One of those factors was that there was a labor movement that arose up in many industry, in many communities that had large immigrant populations like New Bedford at Fall River, like New York City, like Chicago. And those union movement did not want children working in factories. What ingratitude those union people had. Workers not wanting children to work in factories? Go to China. You'll see what real civilization is about. Kids work in factories. Go to England in the middle of the 19th century and see what happened there in the, in the textile and the garment industry. Kids worked in factories. But in the rise of the labor movement, there was a movement against child labor. There also was a movement against women's labor, and there was a movement against Chinese labor, and uh, those were regrettable. But the one against child labor was one of the major factors in putting kids into situations where they were no longer working in plants, in factories, or, in, 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 or near machinery. The second factor, in the, and that's a very, this is a very important factor as well, is that the development of technology, which I'm going to talk about a lot today in relationship to education, the development of technology made child labor to a certain extent redundant. That is to say, fewer people could actually produce more goods, whether it be textiles or garments or, or anything else. And that technology was really the introduction of machinery to replace a large amount of hand labor in the production of goods. And, and so there was a coincidence between political and mass pressure against child labor and the, and the development of machinery itself. We then have a period from 1900, roughly, through the 1970s, when, although the labor movement was only in favor of the first six grades of schooling, because they didn't trust high schools. They thought high schools were already a sign of the bourgeoisification of their, of their kids. If you had a class conscious labor movement, you didn't want the schools to take over your kids' lives, you know. That's something we haven't had much recently anymore, but we'll talk about that as well. But what begins to take place in the 1970s is a situation in American economy which we should all be familiar with, but I say ruefully, we really aren't. Let's put it um, on the table, okay? There are no jobs. We now have had 40 years, since 1973, roughly. Uh, this is a metaphor, 73 is a, is a, is a, uh, a sign, it's a semiotic. It's a sign. We, there are no jobs. Now, that doesn't mean that in every case, in every industry, in every occupation, there are no jobs. But what is true is that while there's a lot of work, 
The nature of that work has changed radically in comparison to what it used to be. A job is a full-time commitment both by the employer and by the employee to work in a workplace for eight hours a day beginning in 1938. The presumption is that you will be called back if you're laid off due to lack of work and in periods of recession, that the job has a how shall I put it? It has a, a, um, it has a, a, a career line. We've heard about careers, right? And that career line, even in manufacturing, even in retail, means that if you start at the bottom, then you have a shot at moving up within the organization. And when the unions came in in the 1930s and 40s, they, they called that career line based on seniority. They called that career line based on job posting, people had a real shot. Now, that again is not because I read a book. I was a steel worker for 10 years. And in my shop in New Jersey, I started out at the bottom. And what it meant to be at the bottom was you, you actually were, was what was called in the industry a bunny lugger. I had a wheelbarrow, I would take uh, steel waste and put it in a pile. I go back and I put another uh, um, uh, bunch of waste on a pile. But by the time I left the mill, I had had jobs that paid three and four times as much as I started out with. That's because we had a bidding system. That is to say, we had a job um, uh, posting system. We had a union. We had a, a say in our union, and I should say this uh, is contrast to what we have now. We had a say in our union, in our plant, this is not true of the steel industry as a whole, but in our plant, the only basis upon which you could get fired is that if you hit the foreman while you were sober. Hardly anybody ever got fired because the union was strong enough. We would give people three days off, we would send them to uh, detox or whatever it was necessary, but they wouldn't get fired. We had a powerful organization. I was a chief griever by the time I left the plant. I wasn't the author of the, of the, of the strength, but it was, a, it was a different kind of life. And you could buy a house, you could uh, have a car, the children, your children could go to college without big um, debt. In New Jersey and New York, there was hardly any tuition. It was just beginning to come in in the 70s. In fact, in New York, it was, all the colleges were free. You went to City College, Brooklyn College, Queens College, Hunter College, the graduate center of the, of the City University of New York, and it was nothing. Student fees, $200, you know, something like that. Now it's $3,000 a semester. It's $6,000 a year. The graduate school is a little more expensive. And of course, what the administration of our graduate school wants is they want more foreign students because the foreign students pay more. And they want students from out of the state because they pay more. Because they are now being consistently cut by the state legislature. And those cuts have generated a situation where now 49% of the, of the uh, operating budget of the City University of New York. It's a, little, it's a small school. We only have 400,000 students. It's a big school. But 49% of the operating budget comes out of tuition. 49%. And that's in 40 years. It started in 1976, 37 years. When I say there are no jobs, it doesn't mean there isn't work. 
Most of the work that is being offered to people today is part-time, contingent, temporary work. The number of part-time, contingent, temporary workers is now up to 14% of the labor force. 14%. It used to be 2%, 3%, 4%. It's gone up five or six times in the last 35 years. Now, what has this got to do with education? Everything. You'll see this in a minute. What it means, and, and, and let's say this, that the corollary of this is this is not confined, being working poor is not confined to people with high school education or less. That is a press release from the Secretary of Education, Bill Gates, and his assistant, Arnie Duncan. <clears throat> Truth of the matter is that college graduates don't have full-time jobs. Many of them are working part-time, many of them are working as service employees. The word service employees, by the way, is a fancy word for waiters and waitresses. Um, and that's not something I invented either. My daughter, my youngest daughter, Nona, graduated from a pretty good school. It's called Wesleyan University. She hasn't got a job. She works freelance. She has not been offered a full-time job in journalism, even though the byline, no, no, Willis Arana, which you can go online and you'll see all of her stuff, it still doesn't pay a living wage. And it's not just her. Most of her cohort, most of her cohort, cohort have made several different choices and one of those choices has been to go to graduate school, not because they want to go to graduate school, because that's the best option they have to postpone the inevitable. Some of them are trying to become lawyers. Now, you may not know this, but the law, which once employed people pretty much full employment, the law is now one of the sources of mass unemployment of prudential lawyers. The only serious the only serious professionals who still have reasonable options for full-time jobs are physicians and nurses, the medical, the, the, the healthcare industry, and computer engineers. But even in computer engineering, if you go to Bill Gates' own factories in Seattle, you will find there's a two-tier system there. There are some with Real, real jobs with benefits, and then there are some who are contingent. They get paid pretty well, but they have to buy their own health insurance, and they have no, insur no assurance that they'll be working tomorrow. They, they're contract laborers. Half of his employers, employees are contract laborers. Arnie Duncan doesn't tell us that. Certainly Bill Gates doesn't tell us that. And of course, the third one is already beginning to be um, no longer the case, which is the military. You can be, you used to be a high school graduate and get into the military and it was a career. They're laying off people in the military. That's the, that's the perspective. And one of the reasons they're laying people off everywhere and changing the nature of the workplace is again technology. If you can kill people with drones, you don't need foot soldiers. Barack Obama is one of the leading figures in promoting unemployment among the military. He is a fierce proponent of drones, but drones have an implication for, I'm speaking technologically, for employment. Not so good. The, the second problem that we have in the economy is despite the fact that we still have eight and a half million industrial workers, 
this country is producing fewer material goods than it did 40 years ago. The service economy, which is largely contingent, pa uh, uh, precarious, part-time, and so on, is very badly paid. And so one of the things that is happening in our, in our economy is that we are building what the uh, candidate for the mayor of the city of New York presciently said in his campaign, we are building a two Americas society. The two Americas are a relatively few people, it's not 1%, you know the Occupy stuff, a relatively few people who have reasonable expectations to maintain full-time secure employment, and that's declining. We want to talk about the acad academia. We now have 27% tenured or tenure-tracking uh, uh, professors. How's the math? 73% of professors are adjunct or temporary. And that has, now, that has uh, continued to decline. The expectation is by 2020, if the, contemporary, if the current trends uh, continue, we'll be down to 20% tenured and 80% adjunct. Contingent. And of course, adding to that is one of the more important innovations in higher education, which is now going to spread to secondary education, and already they're beginning to think about it. It's called uh, online learning. Standardized testing, online learning, the whole transformation of the education system, which is to a large extent designed to create the teacherless classroom. You don't need a Donaldo or Macedo anymore who has face-to-face -face interaction with his students or uh, uh, stu uh, teachers who teach 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 students in a class or even 30. You now can do what Richard Durbin, Richard Durbin, the deputy leader of the United States Senate has done, which is he's enrolled in a class in the University of Illinois, which teaches 30,000 students with one professor. Now you want, you want uh, efficiency, that's efficiency. The professor makes a speech, and then graduate students, many of whom will end up adjunct professors, meet with small groups of 50 to 75 or 100 people. So it becomes the full employment act for underpaid graduate students. And that is spreading like wildfire, including in my university, the City University. They offered me, because I ain't a bad lecturer. They said, Stanley, we want you to do an online course. And I said, no, I won't do it. In the first place, I think there are pedagogical issues as to reasons why I won't do it. In the second place, your motives, your motives, I said to the guy who, who asked me to do it, some, some was, you know, a system, a system wide associate provost, you know, one of these types who hasn't done any serious intellectual work in decades. Um, you know, that's who they are, most of them, you know that. Um, you're smiling, you should look at their academic records. They exhaust themselves after one or two books and a half a dozen articles, and then they become deans. And I ain't shitting you. Go look for it. Anyway, so we have a situation where on the one hand we have um, the extreme, we have things like um, globalization, it used to be called the runaway shop, the migration of huge amounts of manufacturing out of the United States into other parts of the world. On the other hand, we have technological transformation that reduces the part paid by labor in the production of goods. And we have a third, 
in terms of that, we have a reorganization of the labor force so that the average young person today of the millennial generation, my daughter, for example, may not expect to have a full-time job. Now, what are the implications? And the second problem is, politically, what are the implications of this phenomenon politically? In the first place, the worse the situation becomes in the labor market, the more the hype to believe that education is the answer to the bad things in the labor market. Education is not the answer. What's, what, is a, what is an answer is actually a reorganization of the economy so that people can participate in the conditions that affect their own lives. Education, which promises careers for those who keep their noses to the grindstone, is not education. It becomes training and it becomes schooling. And even at every level of schooling, including higher education, a lot of students will not graduate with the prospect of having a job. Now, until and unless we face that, we can't talk seriously about the future of education. I'm going to talk about the future of education now because I think we now have a wonderful opportunity. You, you, you say to yourself, what the hell is he talking about, wonderful opportunity? Well, now we don't have to worry anymore about careers, because there ain't none. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. The teachers have some career. I, that, that's true. But the teachers don't teach teachers so much, although some teachers do. The teachers are teaching workers at various levels of, 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 of credentialing. The credential is no longer a ticket to a job. And if that is the case, that the credential is no longer a, a ticket to a real job, as I've described it, a job with a certain prospect of future, a certain prospect of, of stability, a certain prospect of, of, of a decent uh, uh, wage and, or a salary and living standard, then we have to ask the question, why should people go to school? Well, I want to, make, I want to start by making a distinction. Even for the part-time temporary contingent labor force, which is growing, and for low-wage workers in general, as well as those who are uh, in, in, uh, in more stable occupations, literacy is still very important. And literacy is, in terms of education, a prelude to education, but it is not education. The ability to read and write and the ability to do numeracy is a necessary qualification to do almost any job that you can think about in this society, with some exceptions. If you're really talking about education, however, you've got to ask a different set of questions. At the political level, there is no conversation, including by the liberals, the Diane Ravages and the Jonathan Coswells, about what is to be taught and what is to be learned. What really constitutes a genuine education? Why would we want a genuine education? And the first point that I made is that we don't want a genuine education to help people get jobs because in the first place there aren't any, and for the second place, even if there or you don't need a genuine education to have 90% of the jobs that are offered. One of the characteristics of our current school system is that, it's become, is that learning has become increasingly specialized. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you a story. I, the only solid thing that I ever, well, two things that I ever learned in school, ever learned in school, and I'm just being absolutely serious, I learned how to type in the seventh grade. That's a form of um, literacy, in my opinion. You know, you have to know how to type. 
And as a matter of fact, I would argue that if I never learned how to type, I never would have written a word because my handwriting is absolutely incomprehensible, even to myself. I used to get unsatisfactory in penmanship throughout my entire school career. By the seventh grade, I was typing, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. But that's the first thing I ever learned. But the second thing I ever learned, that is to say seriously in classrooms, was from Dr. Harris, my sixth grade teacher. She was a doctor of languages. She taught us French. She taught us Italian. We learned the, the La Marseillaise. We learned the Garibaldi hymn. We learned Italian literature and French literature in French as well as in English. Why was Dr. Harris teaching a PhD in, in, in languages, in Romance languages, teaching um, um, sixth grade? Because she came out of the Depression and there were no jobs for the language teachers. Guess what? There were no jobs for language teachers in 2013. So maybe what's going to happen is that the Dr. Harris's of 2013 will start teaching elementary school or high school and will start having some knowledge built into our curriculum. But to have knowledge built into the curriculum requires something else. And that is One of the things that happened to me as a teenager actually a little bit earlier, I had two things that helped me. One is that I had working class parents who actually read books. My mother played the violin and she was also a painter. So she dragged me to the museum at the age of nine and so she would <coughs> teach me the violin. And my father, who was a, 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 a technician for the Port Authority of, of New York, he would write poetry and read poetry to me. You, you see where I'm coming from. I didn't learn any, but that much in school, but I had parents who were interested in culture. And they were not middle class, they were not people of, of, of wealth. They came out of traditions where working people actually cared about art and literature and, 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 and things like that. And so out of that experience as a 12 and 13 year old, a 9 and 10, 11 and 12 year old, I started to explore in the library. As well as the teenage organizations that were more radical than we have anything anymore today. But I was reading Aristotle at 15. I read the politics at 15. I read Plato's Republic the same year. 16. I picked up Hegel. And I, read the, I, I didn't understand the word, don't misunderstand me. But I read the phenomenology of the spirit. And I put money out of my own pocket that I worked in. I worked for $10 to buy the phenomenology of the spirit in one of lousy tr translations into English. By 17, I was reading Marx. And of course, I always read literature. I always read, you know, Dickens and Dostoevsky and all that stuff, because that was all, all those books were in the house. My first point, I'm going to put it to you straight, is that the site of education, if it's successful, is both in and out of school. And that if you were going to have a serious educational system in the United States, you would have to begin with the parents. As well as the kids. Because if parents are not involved in schooling themselves, then and then their relationship to, edu to the, school, the children's schooling is going to, to a large extent, be distant and ineffectual. They can't tell the kid to do their homework. They have to begin to help the kid with the homework, although I don't believe in homework. That's a separate issue. 
but they have, they have, the, 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 the adults have to be, be, the, the, be themselves part of the educational system. It cannot be so professionalized and specialized that the only people who do schooling, who do education, are the teachers who are formal teachers. That means that education is a community organizing project. Community organizing project means you have to bring adults into the educational enterprise. But that's only one part of it. There's a second and third part of it, and I want to talk about that in some detail. I am pretty sure, and you can correct me if I'm wrong as far as UMass Dartmouth is concerned, that in very few cases in educational ed, ed schools, the concept that part of our curriculum is the study of developmental psychology should be part of the, of, of the system. There are three developmental psychologists who have influenced me and should influence any teacher, any teacher. The first one is Vygotsky, thought and language, because what Vygotsky does is he raises the question of thought as his, in its relationship to the mastery of language. The second one is Pia, Jean Piaget, the Swiss. Vygotsky was Soviet, Jean Piaget is Swiss. And the third is the American Jerome Bruner, B-R-U-N-E-R. Vygotsky's book, uh, uh, and of course, the, the language and thought of the child by, by uh, uh, Piaget is a major contribution to our understanding. He's a stru genetic structuralist. I can have my criticisms, but they all agreed on one thing. The main site of early childhood education, third, three years old, four years old, five years old, up to nine years old, is not the classroom. The main site is the world is the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, which I went to today, is the streets, is music halls, are places where there is cultural activity going on, where there is various forms of life, where there's a, a, where there's a, a dock, where there's a seashore, where the kids can pick up pebbles, where they're out of the, they're, they're, they're operating out of their blindingly powerful curiosity instead of having the curiosity regimented in classrooms. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be any classrooms, but they actually are radical. They're not, they're not, they're not uh, 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 at, at all shy. And why do they radicalism? They don't actually think that academic subjects are necessary until the fourth grade. Lots of luck in America to get that kind of situation, but at least the fight for bringing the world into child's li children's lives is a terribly important fight. And don't kid yourself, when I was in sixth grade, Dr. Harris took us everywhere. Where she got the money, I can't tell. I don't know. But we went. We went out to the Museum of Natural History, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, to the Metropolitan, to the, to, to the Museum of Modern Art, to the, to, to, to the docks, watching longshoremen actually put things on, on, on ships. I mean, we learned something about work, we learned something about art, we learned something about the nature of the city, we learned architecture, she showed us buildings, I'll never forget. Um, of course, I, I got, went to school in New York, and I understand the issue. But I went to, uh, I went to uh, New Bedford today, and the architecture is gorgeous. A teacher could bring a kid to New Bedford, a group of kids, and talk about the architecture. The, some of its 17th and 18th century architecture in downtown New Bedford. That's fascinating. And go and find out what it is that informed that architecture. And sometimes you have to do with, 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 with film, and sometimes, or video, you know, some of that stuff can be done. 
But it's getting out of the notion that the text is the only place that learning takes place and the classroom is the only site. Okay? The, the second part of this is that, the, that high school should be, as it was in France and still is in many, many parts of France, high school should be the t time when kids actually learn philosophy. And that should be, in my opinion, a required course. I had to do it on my own, because in my high school I didn't have any philosophy. All I did is play the violin in high school, by the way. But that was good. But I, I picked up philosophy, and, and, and in France they had philosophy. There's a great actress whose name is Simone Signoret, and she uh, went to Lycée, which is high school, and she had a teacher in philosophy. Pretty good teacher, she said. His name was Jean-Paul Sartre. He was a high school teacher. We don't have, we don't have a, a teaching core in the United States that would know Sartre from you know, a hole in the ground. They are not exposed in high school, they're not exposed in college. They have become specialized. Why is it important to learn philosophy? For two reasons. One, philosophy is the most general science, and I use this word not in the natural science sense of the term, but it's the most general science for an attempt to acquaint students with ideas about the world that are at a level of abstraction that they do not confront either in the social sciences or most of the humanities. It's about what is the nature of, of, of the world. Secondly, it's, a, it's, a, it's about what is ethics? How do we understand ethics? What is the distinction between the good and the bad? How do we conduct our lives on the basis of those distinctions? Of course, the other thing that should be getting high school, which is formally there in most high schools, but is not, 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 not really well done, or maybe even in elementary school, is exposure to world literature. I'm not just talking about George Eliot's Silas Marner that I had to learn in high school, or even, you know, or even uh, you know, the prescribed Charles Dickens and this and that and the other. Of course, we have to take a standardized test. I'm talking about, because since we're, we're living in a, in a global situation, I'm talking about a champion. Things fall apart, no longer at ease. Talking about the transformation of Africa by colonialism and by moder modernity, those things should be, we should all be exposed to that. We should be studying Caribbean literature because there are many Caribbeans in this country. George Lamming, for example, who's written about migration, immigration, we're talking immigration all the time, but, but there's a literature about immigration. There's Jews Without Money by Mike Gold about the Jews on the Lower East Side. There's, there's works by a contemporary woman novelist, Pauli Marshall about Brooklyn and about, you know, Caribbeans in Brooklyn. But that's only part of it. Sometimes you will get, you know, man-child in the promised land. Sometimes you will, you will get some black literature. But I promise you that the amount of literature from the global literature, blacks and Latinos and Caribbeans and Africans in the public schools is sparse. We have to insist on a growth of that kind of stuff, as well as 19th century people who made contributions to our understanding of ourselves. I'm going to say a couple of things now about what we should be doing about, about the principles of education. I haven't mentioned one thing, and I'm going to do that, but I'm not spending much time. Any child 
any child between the ages of 5 and 17 who has never had contact with a musical instrument, with a paintbrush, with a drawing board, has been seriously deprived of their imagination. Seriously deprived. When you listen to the poo poo, that's a scientific term, that comes out of these mouths of these people like Duncan and like, and like Gates and telling people about science and mathematics and that's because there's where the jobs are. You really have to say to yourself, these people really haven't got the least idea of what it is that constitutes a serious education because the cultural development of people, the development of the imagination is what makes them creative. And I'm going to say something that, that, that probably you have thought about but it bears re repeating. There are three points about education. Three principles. One, that an education should give people, forget students in, in the terms that we're speaking about, should give people the possibility of understanding themselves and their relationship to the world. Who am I? What is my background? What is my tradition? What is, what is my community? What, where do I fit in? Where do I live? I don't mean just the address, but a sense of self. The second principle is an understanding of the world. The economic, the political, the social, and the cultural nature of the world in which we live. And that world is not a pretty world, and that world is not the world that is, that is uh, 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 made present by the hype that we get in, in the newspapers and in many of the, uh, uh, even of many of the, uh, the scholarly works. That world is much, much, for most kids, more brutal. But they should understand that world. They should have the opportunity to understand that world. And the third, which is in some ways the most important, is that a child or, 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 or an adult should be encouraged to be creative. That is to say, to create the new, to create the, 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 the different. Not to be told that's wrong if you have an answer, but to be asked to explain why you had that answer. The, the, you know why that's important? I studied physics. There's a man by the name of Lee Small, physicist, high energy particle physicist. He's in Canada. And Smolin, S M O L I N, has argued quite convincingly that physics has not made any progress in 25 years because the physicists are, st are stuck in string theory. I'm not going to get into the nature of the, of the debate, but what is interesting about it is that in the sciences, the number of people who study in the sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, are basically trained to accept the prevailing wisdom and are not encouraged to break away. We would have no Marx, we would have no Freud, we would have no John Dewey, we would have no Salt, we'd have nobody around us if we had if, if that was universally impressed on, on children. We have to encourage creativity. So let me tell you a little story again. So my daughter Nona goes to a school elementary school called the Brooklyn New School. It is a school which is established by parents and by teachers who break away from the established school. And during the period when they established the school, which was the late 70s and early 80s, they got away with it because there was a, a school board, that was a local school board that said, okay, we'll try, to, we'll try to do it. 150 students came into that school and parents who were on the board, I was on the board, the parents selected the principal, had to be approved by the higher-ups, but we did the selection. We reviewed the curriculum, 
And one of the elements of that curriculum was developed by Anna. I'm going to tell you about Anna. She's now the principal of the school. Anna would encourage my daughter. She, my, she was the fourth grade teacher. She would encourage my daughter and the other kids in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the class to give their ideas. And she taught them what a theory is. What is a theory, right? A theory is a, a set of ideas at the level of generality that helps explain or account for a wider and wider array of phenomena, right? And she never said to the kids, and they had to write it down, and they had to get up in front of the class and actually present their theory. And she didn't say, you're wrong, you're right, because the theories that they came up with were mostly cockamamie. But she asked them to explain how they came about developing their theory, and she did a critique of, the, of those theories. And those kids learned how to think. Because learning how to think is in some sense learning how to make sense of your world without the prompting of all the authorities in the world. You know, you have to have the authorities. I'm not, I'm not somebody who hasn't uh, been influenced by various people. But you also have to be able and willing to account for that. And you, all of you, or most of you who are PhD students, will understand what I'm talking about. My PhD students do not repeat the ordinary shit. Otherwise, they're not my PhD students anymore. I ask them to develop an original idea. And those who won't do it don't become, don't, don't become my PhD students and go on to my colleagues. In other words, I don't want to just want an empirical study of something that everybody knows about already. I want somebody who's going to actually develop an original idea. So uh, that means that whether you do it uh, in sociology or whether you do it in education, you're actually testing out something that hasn't been thought about precisely by everybody else. And I've made a terrible discovery. The nature of our educational system, and in our, our place I get students from Brown, I get students from Wesleyan, I get students from City University, I get students from Rutgers, I get students from Harvard, all these places. There's no place where they're genuine, genuinely encouraged to have their own thoughts. Hardly anybody. And so part of what I've decided as a teacher is that I have, when they say, what do you teach? And you said sociology and education. That's what I'm a professor of. They pay me for that. I teach reading, and I teach how to be, how to be original. I'm sort of original. Mostly I'm wrong. I have some elements of being right, but mostly I'm wrong. One of them is, for example, this, uh, this attempt that I've made to uh, make a distinction between uh, uh, schooling and education. I'm not the only one to do it. But in some sense, I've developed these kind of principles of education and how do you make it possible for people to do this. And one way you make it possible is you don't tell people right or wrong. The ethical question is not whether somebody's right or somebody's wrong according to established theory or established ideas. What you try to do is to do what is called an imminent critique. An imminent critique, I-M-N-A-N-E-N-T, -E yeah, I, yeah. Imminent critique is you take their ideas and you question them on the basis of their ideas to help them sharpen and to, for them to come to the conclusions that, uh, that, that their ideas are somehow flawed or somehow correct. That you treat people as creative human beings. And if you do that, what you'll find is that one out of five students, one out of ten students, depends on where you are, will actually emerge in ways that they would not have emerged otherwise. And nine out of ten, or eight out of ten, or six out of ten, are generally speaking, 
not going to be able, at least initially, to do that. But if you had a, if you had a collective of, of teachers, then you would have a whole environment in which the learning of the self, the learning of the world, the world, and the attempt to be original and creative will be part of what the curriculum is all about. We would have to create institutions, not individuals, but institutions and, and, and practices that are collective practices that would elaborate these concepts together with a, uh, a set of readings and curriculum and so on that is very, very, very difficult to do. But that would be one thing. I'm going to say one more thing and then I think I should shut up. Um, when I say I teach reading, unlike what I'm doing tonight, I rarely do lectures. In fact, I almost never do lectures, except if I'm talking you know, publicly. We do close reading in my classes. And what is, and this is PhD, only PhD students. And what does close reading mean? And I'm going to give you one example and I'll show you what I mean. Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1. The wealth of these societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails is characterized by an immense accumulation of commodities, the single unit, is, the unit is a single, the single unit is the commodity. Now, that's a paraphrase of the first line of Marx's Capital Volume 1. I would stop. I'd say, okay, what are you making of? If we were lucky, we would get to page two for the whole session, if we were lucky. Because the whole point is to try to stimulate a discussion around extremely difficult problems. So that people begin to grasp what they're talking, what they're reading. That's why I call myself a reading teacher. And I don't say, your interpretation is wrong, your interpretation is inadequate. I say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I use the Socratic method in order to elicit response and discussion. And uh, sometimes I also elicit people who ask me questions. And the, the, other thing that is, the other thing that I try to do as a reading teacher is I try to raise the ante on the difficulty of the texts. So that when I say I'm a reading teacher, that's not entirely true. The other part of what I do is that I'm a philosophy teacher. So that um, it is possible for me to um, read a power, read, uh, to do an extract in my classes from Hegel, from the Frankfurt School from somebody else and have a discussion about what they're talking about. The third thing I do, and that's, that's, that's what I'm doing next semester. I teach, next semester I'm teaching George Lukács and the Frankfurt School. I'm teaching a, a book called History of Class Consciousness. I'm teaching One Dimensional Man by Marcuse. And we'll do exactly the same as I just described. We will never get through the text. I don't even worry about getting through the text. I'm happy to get through a chapter for the semester. So what happens with the rest of the book? They come in and they make their own presentations, you know. What I'm saying, finally, is that um, we have to reconstruct the educational system without regard to whether the jobs are there or not. We have to be asking people what is your agency in the, in the world? Are you here to fit into the system or are you here to try to change the conditions of your own life, at least to understand the conditions of your own life? And if the answer is that you're interested in changing the world or even understanding the conditions of your own life, and that that's the real point of education, then we have a wholly different project than that which the, uh, the administration uh, in Washington, or for that matter in most school systems, is interested in. 
It doesn't mean that you don't have to learn what has already been said. Matthew Arnold says, you know, he wants literature is the best that, that's thought and said. But it means that if that's the limit of your comprehension and your relationship to knowledge, then you will always repeat the past. And if we as a society are going to go forward, we're going to have to find the people who have something new to say. And the only way to do that is to ask them to take the risk of originality. Thanks a lot. I can't hear you. Only 73 now. understanding the self. The self, and the other one is understanding the world. Yeah. Know thyself. John Dryden. Yes. Okay. All right. so, so one of the ways to experience understanding the world um, it is uh, technologically. Absolutely. Uh, also, as a steel worker, you were demanding um, a technology of sorts. Mm -hmm. right? at, of sorts. Uh, at that particular time. Computer-based technology so, at that time. So today, we have a technology which is the internet and, and using that. So um, what I'm trying to understand is what is your opposition to using, te thank you, Sean, using technology such as online curriculum as part of a blended learning uh, pedagogy uh, to, uh, you know, to, to uh, uh, deal with a very diverse audience? That's a very good question. Everybody got the idea. What, what, uh, uh, the problem with online learning, online pedagogy, is that it is usually um, bereft of gesture. You, if you're sitting in a classroom of 20, 25, 10, 15 people, you can discern people's gestures you can see the person slumping, you can see the other person's exciting, you have a whole um, sight and sound of, uh, of experience that you don't have online. What you have online is essentially a text. And, I was, and my whole point was to argue that the text is only a, a part of what learning is about. I want to look at the students and see who's getting it and who's not getting it. And often, even though they're not getting it, they're not going to go online and tell you that they're not getting the point. The second problem is that my, that my pedagogical style 
is close reading. Online stuff is essentially a lecture, it's a stimulus response. It's based, online learning, by the way, is based to a large extent on, on, on the Skinner. It's a, it's a behaviorist notion. Now, if you want me to discuss why I think behaviorism is not a good uh, pedagogical um, um, method, I will say this. When I, I'm not asking students to repeat after me. To, to behave in ways that are approved by a system that wants them to conform to the existing situation. I'm asking them to rebel. And I'm asking them to respond both emotionally as well as intellectually, as well as in their own language. And I think that's not facilitated with, 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 with um, online stuff. Now, I am for that. I, I use the internet for information, and the model of um, online uh, learning is essentially information. I don't think education is about information. Information you can get online. But what you can't get is critical understanding of what is going on. And that critical understanding is only possible on the basis of, co of a complex uh, of interaction of intersubjectivity, which is more than simply speaking, but is also interacting people with people at different levels. That's my short answer. Raise the hands, but uh, we don't have to ask the question, so I will. Uh, I, I have to absolutely agree with you on the importance of, of parental involvement. That's a big topic in the, the schools in this particular area. And the stories you've told about your own upbringing are very poignant because I had many of the same experiences growing up. But I think if we go back in time, the question I want to ask is, there was a whole social fabric in working class communities that seems to have disintegrated with the industrialization. I mean, starting with union halls, uh, there were workers' colleges, there were labor theaters, uh, there was just a whole network of institutions that supported that, that fabric where parents did read at home and they did take you to museums and field trips and, and all of those things. And how do we get back to that point when that whole network of institutions is just disintegrated around us? Well, first for everybody's, everybody's edification, because you know a lot of this. If, if, you, were, if you were in um, almost any industrial city in the United States, including Fall River, New Bedford, for example, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, yeah, but you know, small uh, Detroit, but small, smaller communities as well, there was a workers' theater. There, there was, there was a, a, a workers' film organization that made film locally. Now we would have video, which is much easier to make than it was in the, in the 30s um, or the 20s. Um, you would have choruses. The industrial workers of the world, for example, had a songbook. Show me a union today that actually distributes a songbook. And every time they went on a march or a strike, or even had a union meeting, they'd sing union songs. So that's, that's the background. The only way to recreate, I'm, I'm just speaking about the workers, uh, to create those conditions is to have a whole new conception of both community and labor organizing. You have to have a whole new conception that is based on education and not based on demands for immediate results. Not to say that you don't, you don't ask for higher wages or you don't ask for better housing or you don't ask for for uh, you know, a, a, a very good um, uh, transportation system. All of those things are necessary, but they're necessary but not sufficient. The sufficiency is to, is to begin to build among, I use the word parents, but to build among community members, especially parents, the capacity for themselves to become educators in the first place of their own children and the second place for the community at large. You have to have different kind of organization for that. Our unions, uh, I have to say this so that you get, you get some perspective. I didn't say this. So. I stepped down in 2000, 
and nine. I, I declined to run for re-election as a member of the Executive Council of the Professional Staff Congress of the City University of New York. We are a small union. We only represent 18,000 people. And I was on the negotiating committee. We were a rank and file movement, and I, we came back to what we came to we came to leadership. I spent nine years as an organizer, as a as a activist in, in in the American Federation of Teachers, local, uh, and I was on AAUP boards and all that kind of stuff. What I could never get them to understand, except we did it a little bit. Maybe they understood it, but they said we haven't got time for that and this and that. Is that we as an educational union should be educators, not just educators in the university teaching classes or even educational activity for our uh, membership, which we should have, and we don't. They don't have time for that. But we should be edu We should be working with the communities. We should be helping elementary and secondary school people to build different kinds of environments in their schools. And they were, you know, they, they said, we're so busy. I said, what are we busy with? You know, we're, I couldn't get to first base, but the problem obviously, I did, did get to first base, but I couldn't get beyond that. The problem that we have is that until and unless we have a social movement, the, 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 the unions become social movements, one, who the social movements understand themselves no longer as merely, not merely, I don't want to say merely, as only protests and resistance vehicles, but see themselves as educational vehicles. Until those things are there, we're not going to have anything in the country that's going to make sense educationally. I am categorically denying, and I think you should hear this loud and clear, I'm categorically denying that the classroom is the main site of education. I'm categorically denying that. I'm trying to broaden the conception in which the classroom is a site, that there are no main sites, it's a multiplicity of sites, and they're all terribly important. Now, I use the word parental involvement. I don't use the word involvement. I understand what you mean. I mean, we're, we're on the same page. I want parents to start reading. I know that they have trouble reading because they go because women are working as well as men are working everybody's working themselves to death sometimes two or three jobs but at some point we have to face the possibility that in some places there will be parents who will understand that they have an equal responsibility for the education of their children as teachers and that responsibility is not simply to keep to teach it to kids, uh, uh, to kick kids in the ass and say, do your homework, but it's to say, how can we learn together? That's a, serious, that's a serious move for parents. How can they begin to be people who know something about literature and philosophy as well as science and technology and so on? That's a serious, that, that, that's, that's, that's a tough issue. I've been advocating about it, and you know, I think that in some places I have some influence, and some places I don't, but mostly not. And until we get beyond that, I think we're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, I took a bunch of classes at the Labor Guild. At where? The Labor Guild. I don't know the Labor it's, um, it's a union school. Um, yeah. In, it's in Quincy or Weymouth or something. And um, the only people I see there are people from the construction trades. It's open to all unions, and, and I never see anybody but the construction trades there. And when I ask them about it, they say that the unions don't leverage that resource, and the classes are good and interesting. Um, and so I, I wonder what that says about unions today, and um, something that I feel like the union people I talk to don't really understand the benefits of being in a union. They understand the, the financial benefit or the insurance benefit. They don't understand the collective benefit. All right, let me let me let me put it. Let me let me put the. Uh, the cards on the table, okay? It was only the radicals, the anarchists, the socialists, and the communists who gave a damn about education in the labor movement, okay? Now that they are basically, they haven't disappeared completely, but they're mostly gone. The labor movement has become a series of business organizations. 
And what workers expect of their unions is wages and benefits and some degree of job security. They don't expect that their unions will be places where they can, you know, learn stuff about themselves and the world. Once upon a time, my grandfather, my mother's father, came to the United States and for reasons having to do with, I guess, his own reasons, he wanted to get to become a citizen. The union that he belonged to, which was in the men's clothing industry, he was a very good worker, offered classes in citizenship, but the classes in citizenship were, went beyond the Constitution and went beyond uh, you know, learning the English language, which he in fact did learn. They also taught ideology. They taught the union's perspective on politics, on struggle, on culture, and so on. And needless to say, it had a permanent effect on not only my, my grandfather, although he had it already from, from uh, Belarus, he was from Minsk, but it had an effect on my mother. My mother was forced for a variety of reasons to drop out of school at the age of 14 to go to work. My mother, however, was a voracious reader, a fiddler, a painter. She spent all of her spare time doing those things. Didn't, she didn't raise me very much, because that was a whole different story. But, um, but, but that kind of tradition she knew about and she was very much influenced by. The difficulty that we have today is that we've had a break, a serious break of the tradition. However, we have an opportunity. And that opportunity is that we have 11 million immigrants in the United States. Many of them in the world are among the working poor. There will have to be new unions. Some of the old unions will participate, but they're going to have to be new unions organizing the working poor. And in those organizational efforts, and I have had some influence there, they're going to have to develop a program of education. Because they're going to have to learn English and they're going to have to also learn what it is to, how they can, how they can fight and what it is to fight. And uh, that may be a new opportunity. But the old unions and their older members, their more established members, I haven't got much hope for. I have to say that. I wish I did. We do have in the United States, in the private sector, 93% of the workers are not in unions. So the new opportunities would be in the organizations of unions for education. But I do think it's also true that a lot of community organizing is really about issues rather than about the development of people to become leaders of their own existence and their own life. And the community organizers have to learn how to become educators and how to develop educators among their people. When I was an organizer, <clears throat> I was pretty good. And they said, well, what were you like as an organizer? I said, I never was never really an organizer. I was always an educator. Well, what do you mean you were an educator? When I worked with a group of workers, I was a resource for them. I didn't go lead them into the promised land. I would try to provide them with, with, with some knowledge, with some critical understanding of their own conditions. And the reason that we continually organize relatively successfully was because the real responsibility for building a new movement is not in the leadership, it's in the people themselves. And I think that's what the labor movement has lost sight of. Okay. Yes, you got the. Yeah, I just wanted to say hello to Alexandra McGee. Um, I'm from New Bedford, Massachusetts. So You're gonna I'm have glad. to talk louder. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. I'm Alexandra Meniz, and uh, I've been born and raised in New Bedford, so I'm glad that you got to see us. Um, I had a question, though. As far as New Bedford speaking, we have a lot of poverty and um, sort of rough edges and stuff like that. I'm wondering if um, your thoughts on how children should view the bad as well as the good on their field trips or going out to seeing the world. I didn't get the nature of the question. 
Same question. Okay. Um, what your thoughts are on take New Bedford, for instance. It's got a lot of rich history and stuff like that, but it also has um, poverty and a lot of bad things that go on in New Bedford, uh, drugs and things like that, unemployment. I just want to know what your thoughts are on um, children seeing the bad as well as the good things that they can see with, within the world. Okay. Poor, poor, you know, poor people, I, I don't know, real poor people, um, have lives that are almost completely masked to the non-poor, especially to the middle class. Middle class people just simply never have any contact except as maid servants and in restaurants and places to poor people. Poor people have systems of morality and they have systems of, um, of ethics which are not articulated as systems of morality and ethics, but they have, they have values. And um, children develop those values. And children of all social uh, uh, formations develop similar values. Not the same values, but they develop values as well. The, the problem is that those values are often mediated, mediated means in this case, by the, by, by the, by the media, they're mediated by their own defeats, by their own sense of hopelessness sometimes. The good and the bad get very confused because the problem of what is bad and what is good is not simple. It's very often situational. And uh, uh, to develop, uh, uh, to develop uh, a system of values that you could describe as, as good, you know, is very hard. I'm going to give you an example which is, which is um, banal. If a, when I was a kid, I had a friend who lived next door in the Bronx, whose parents were almost 100% unemployed for most of the time. And he was very poor. And anything that Kenny wanted, he had to steal. He taught me and some of my friends how to steal in Woolworths. We went into Woolworths, we knew how to steal. I didn't have to steal that much. My parents were not impoverished, but they didn't, you know, they didn't have that much, but I didn't have to steal. But for Kenny, stealing was a way of getting stuff that he couldn't otherwise have. And the problem, obviously, is how do you evaluate that? That would be a question that I would raise in a in a philosophy course, an ethics course, does one's class position, does one's social position in general condition one's set of values and does it, is there an absolute set of values against ceiling? Well, it, I, I have another point of view. The invocation against ceiling on a practical level is that you can get pinched, you can get put into jail, or you can get a fine. But as a set, but as a value, the implication against stealing is a way of, defi of, of defending private property. Now, if you take the position that private property, as Proudhon had said, famous 19th century guild socialist, Pierre Joseph Proudhon said, property is theft then what Kenny did as an eight, ten, eight, nine, ten year old in stealing, apart from the danger of getting pinched, was really not unethical. It was simply a counter, say, a counter um, uh, expression of his way of addressing the problem 
of his exclusion from the benefits of private property. One more example so you get another, another way of thinking about it. I have a friend, actually he was my student, Peter Bratzis, who is working on the problem of corruption. And he's written a very good article about corruption. He's now working on a book. One of the things about corruption is that if I, if you, if, 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 if you do me a favor and I give you a gift and you happen to be in public office and you did me a favor, let's say you prevented my, my uh, eviction from, from an apartment or from a house or from a foreclosure, and in gratitude, I give you, I don't know, something. The way in which that's looked upon in our contemporary society is that's corruption. But I think it's much more ambiguous than that. I may have sincerely been grateful, and how do I express my gratitude? One way of doing that is by giving a gift. Does it mean that you gave me the... Um, you, you, you help me because um, I'm going to give you the gift? Not necessarily, but if you went to a court of law, they might regard that as corruption. When I was a union organizer, and, and, and I, was, I worked for the city of New York <clears throat> uh, for a while as well, people tried to give me gifts. I always had to refuse because I knew the costs from the point of view of law. Of that, but I never thought that I was being bought off by those gifts. I had a whole different attitude, a whole different way of thinking about it. There's more ambiguity in the relationship between good and bad than most of us take, take into account. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on something in your own chapter three of Against Schooling, and that is the idea of the sidelining of the public intellectual. So you can talk about that maybe historically, when and how that happened. Why, for instance, now in the media, you see so much of Ann Coulter, but no known Chomsky's. And if we are in a society where we're viewing intellectuality as an apparatus for the revolution, and that's why it's important, the public intellectual is sidelined. So what's your question? If you can speak, elaborate a little bit more on that. Like historically, why and when, the, in, at least in the United States, this public intellectual become so marginalized? Oh, I see. Oh, that's a simple question. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's Richard Hofstadter in, in the 1960s, uh, I guess, uh, he died in 1970. It wasn't his last book, it was an excellent last book. It was, he wrote a book called Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, and his, um, he was a historian at Columbia University, liberal, you know, but nobody special. Uh, from the point of view of radicalism. And uh, what Hofstadter argued is that we have a culture of anti-intellectualism. Part of it is because of the frontier, part of it is because of um, America's relationship to the rest of the world. Part of it is because of the conditions of industrialization. But one of the consequences of our anti-intellectualism which is very deeply penetrated in, in the population, is that anyone, forget public, who decides to be an intellectual of any kind, I'm not talking about a specialist, you know, I'm talking about an intellectual. An intellectual is somebody who takes a much broader view of the world, who actually engages in what might be described as popular philosophy, that is to say, ad addressing large, large issues. Anybody who's an intellectual and who does, who does not decide to become an idiot, the Greek meaning of idiot is specialist, right? Understand that. And it, it, it is scorned or made fun of. And there's a, there's a literature that follows the 1970s, 60s, 70s, which argues that, which pro provides evidence that kids, when they go to school, when they, the whole notion of the egghead, the whole notion of somebody who is a uh, who, who is a, an intellectual who has intellectual interests as a child is always made fun of or scorned is part of our culture. Now, what that means 
is that if you don't, and then the second part of it is that if you don't fit in, if you don't, just, if you don't go along with the program, the program of this is sociology, this is education, this is political science, this is, um, um, you know, natural science. If you don't go along with the program and you decide to be original and even oppositional, you're not going to be respected. The media won't pick you up, except, except if you, under very unusual circumstances. You won't get a, a, a genuine public hearing. You won't be able to publish in mainstream um, newspapers or television or books, and you'll be, you, 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 you're marginalized. Now, there's a lot of people that I know who, in the fear of marginalization and ostracism, fell, fall into line and become liberals or become conservatives because they don't want to be sticking out like a sore thumb. Thumb. There are other people, like myself, who have had all of the opportunities. I taught at Columbia University, and I went to, I taught at the University of California. Uh, had all of the opportunities to be mainstream, and refused to be mainstream because we grew up and learned the lesson of our growing up that if you fall into line, you are brain dead. Under in a system like ours, which is on the verge of falling apart, providing hardly any opportunities for hardly any people anymore, brutally subordinating people both in the in the classroom and in the public law, and in the public sphere. And I would rather be marginal. It just it's incomprehensible that I should take my whole tradition. In my, in my case, and deny it and become, and become a conformist. I just wrote a book on C. Wright Mills. It's called Taking it, Making It Political Intellectuals. And what, what, what Mills thought about the 1950s, 40s and 50s, it had become the age of conformity. And he refused to be a conformist. He became a public intellectual. He was one of the few of, of, of his point of view that got a public hearing, but he had all of the opportunities in the world to just be an ordinary, you know, sociologist who did good work and studied the poor or, you know, do stuff like that, but he studied power. You can't study power in America and be in the mainstream. You study power in America, even if you're not so smart, like I'm not so smart, even if you're not so smart, you're going to stumble on a Basic, a basic uh, fact that power in America is not plural. It's highly concentrated at the top. It's one tenth of one percent of the of the, uh, of, of the population controls over forty percent of wealth. You're going to say those things, and you may even sit down in the parks of big cities and small communities and protest your position. That doesn't make you very popular. But it's worth it because you know why? Because otherwise, what the hell is life? Is it what life about? You grow your kids, and you know you buy a house, or you rent a house, or you have a few, uh, you know, uh, a few friends and relatives. That's a life for some people. But if you have a life that you want to really make a difference, and I try to help my kids think that way, my youngest daughter has picked it up. If you want a life that makes make a difference. You're going to be marginalized, at least for a while. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've learned in some of the, the classes that I've I've sat in that um, you know there are there are cracks in the system, and Dr. Par cracks. and Dr. Parashiva talks about um, the importance of or the approach of operating within the cracks. You know, and and trying to you know saying. That's where you, you can kind of move. And teaching us about hegemonics and I, I you know, I see, I kind of, I study the different writers and I see common themes. And I'm curious, where, where do you see the, 
the buzz right now as far as this what, what would you call the like the Drew, the Apple, your, yourself, uh, Lois, Apple. Want, want, Lois Wiener, <laughs> like all the, what, what would you call this, this, sci- this like subtle movement that is, is growing and pulsing and where do you see the, where's, where's, where's the, the buzz right now? What are the, what are the underutilized, not under, what are the, what are the areas that people aren't paying attention to that are that you see out there in your your experience that you're like that's that's where it's at right now. Okay. That's what you know. I'm a collaborator with Henry Giroux, right? Yes. We've yep. written Two books together, but yep. but I've had some lo- a long time relationship with him since 1980. Uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Um, there are cracks in the system. You're, you're absolutely right. There are interstices into which you can intervene and to some extent have some influence. But one of the characteristics of the system, the capitalist system as it presently exists in the United States, is that there is no consistent collective, not just protest, not just uh, resistance, but also a search for alternatives. And if there is no collective force that can begin to make some changes as is beginning to develop in places like Greece, for example, where there is a a left party which had 4% of the vote some years ago, now has the, has 37% of the, of, the, of, the, of support in the, in the polls and might take power next time. If you don't have those kinds of institutions as well as collective efforts to build a different kind of culture and to build a different kind of political understanding that goes beyond the specialization of education, but that incorporates education into a larger political project, then the system recuperates the protest. Let me give you a very, from my own experience, I was very active in the anti-war movement in the 1960s, the anti-Vietnam War movement. The anti-Vietnam War movement, the feminist movement, uh, my, my, uh, my partner and my wife was a very prominent feminist, Ellen Willis. The anti-war movement, the, 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 the radical feminist movement, the Black Freedom Movement, except for the NAACP, which has, you know, founded in 1909, the first one in 1909, 1910, and it still exists. Those radical movements did not succeed, for a variety of reasons, in building organizations that provided the cultural, educational, as well as the political weight that would be necessary to make change. And there was a certain tendency in the new left, of which I was a part, to oppose those organizations. And I, I must say, I'm gonna, you, you didn't mention this book, you probably don't know it, but I wrote a book in 2006, published, it's still in print, called um, Left Turn, in which I call for a new political formation in the United States. And say that without that political formation, those cracks are gonna be covered up. And we are in a period now where the new possibilities have emerged because of the failure of, of, of American capitalism to take its own people into account. The American people are 50% poor, 50% below, not the official poverty line, but below what it takes in various communities to survive decently, 50%. That's a lot of people. That's not the that's not the 15% that is officially poor. And, the, and most, many people are experiencing downward mobility. The, the, the middle class is disappearing, disappearing before our eyes. And yet we have no coherent political organization that speaks as um, the old Protestant term, a Methodist I think it is, that speaks truth to power. That's the problem. And the truth to power is not about reform today. It's about fundamental social change. It's not about reform. We can't show, we can't reform a system that that is that is disintegrating before our eyes. We can't. We can try. 
I'll support any reform movement that has got any real uh, possibility. I mean, look, just to give you an example. We have a phony health care system that has been proposed by the president and his, and his administration called uh, affordable care. Everybody knows, I use the word everybody, including people who support it, that we, we need a version of single payer health care. That's what we need. we need. It should be universal. It should be Medicare for all. It's a, it's a simple reform, which would put the insurance industry out of business. <laughs> That's all. Otherwise, no problems. <laughs> and of course, because the insurance industry is going to be put out of business, the administration has compromised the basic principle of affordable health care with the insurance industry. And we have a small organization, which is called uh, Health Care for All, which tries to get people's interest. We have over 800 local unions in the United States and the AFL-CIO, as well as many of its affiliates, have come out for single payer, and they're not willing to flood Washington and occupy the Capitol. You're not willing to occupy the Capitol and the state capitals, then you're not willing to do anything. Because the problem at this point is that the legislative process is completely broken down, you have to take direct action. You have to have a whole different perspective on what constitutes democracy. You have to take the Arab Spring and Madison, Wisconsin of 2011 as your model and not Harry Reid or, um, or uh, Barack Obama as your model. And that takes a lot, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a jump, that is a risk. I mean, we could still call in New York City anyway, and in Detroit and other places, Saturday afternoon marches and demonstrations. But to take a couple of days off from work and occupy Albany or occupy Boston or occupy Washington and, you know, begin to up the ante, people are not yet ready for that. And the reason they're not yet ready for that largely is because they don't believe that they can do it. They don't believe that they have the capacity for power. And that capacity has to be built, it has to be cultivated, it has to be developed. I, I, I had a lot to do with New York um, Occupy Wall Street. Those, those, those kids, I use the word kids, but they started out as, you know, as, as undergraduates who graduated college and had no jobs. And they knew that the liberals were willing to give them lip service, but they didn't get any notice until they sat down in Zuccotti Park. They occupied public space. That's a very different perspective that had been that was was customary. And by and by a couple of weeks, they got arrested. Seven hundred got arrested on Brooklyn Bridge. A hundred and ten communities around the country had had occupy movements. And then around the world, because it, it was because everybody knows the system no longer works. Hi, yeah. so, I, just a, I just have a quick. So how, you're following up. Just a follow up, a quick follow up. So uh, it seems that you know the people in Zuccotti Park and the opera, you know. They were, you know, they were jobless, so their comfort level was sacrificed, you know, sacrifice motivated them to want to do something about it. Um, when you, we talk about just the passive people that, you know, are in a union that, you know, you had talked about representing a union saying, hey, I want to educate, I want to improve, you know, while they were kind of thinking like, well, we want you to, to you know, fight for our rights or fight for this or that, where you're like, no, I want to, I want to educate you. The strength is in you in, in organizing. Um, how do you how do you break through the, the, the to the people that are passive and just you know? Uh, <laughs> you have to take exemplary action. They did, and when, and when we met, I met with some of the key figures, and I said, "You got to create a permanent organization because if you don't create a permanent organization, they're going to break your line." And they did. Eighteen cities, they went real boom with the cops, all dressed in riot gear. And I said, "If you don't have an organization that can outlive." Defeat, you're going to disintegrate, and that's what happened. And they said, Stanley, we agree with you, but if we ever, if we, if we, if we, if we took your your position back to the back to the 
to the assembly, and they had popular assemblies, which was wonderful. And if you took the position, we would split the movement. And I said, every great movement has splits. Splits are not the worst thing in the world. You cannot have the religion of unity all the time because sometimes you're going to have differences and you've got to tolerate the differences and go on. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm not used to hearing myself on the microphone. Sorry. Um, I'm actually an art history major, so I'm probably in the very small minority here that's not studying education. But um, I found it very interesting what you were saying in your lecture regarding the role of um, cultural education in our educational system. Um, music, literature, art, architecture, all of that. And um, when I was in high school, um, my junior, senior year was right around when the economy started to really take a hit, 2008, 2009. And um, as a result, in the public education system, um, the schools were forced to cut back on their budgets and the arts are the first thing to take a hit. And um, what a lot of people were saying regarding that back then is that um, what's been defined or what's come to be defined as important in education is what's on standardized tests, math, English, um, science, that sort of thing, and there is no MCAS for the arts. So um, I was just wondering what your take on the standardized test system in our educational system in the country is. Um, in terms of like the MCAS here, the regions in New York, those sort of exams? Uh, two comments. One, um, the reform that was proposed by the administration and echoed in almost all the states of the union and education departments of, in the union, that we had to get rid of art and music in behalf of science and, uh, and mathematics was a scandal. Now, I'm going to say something about science and mathematics in a minute. We didn't have the art historians and the music uh, people and the, and the literary people and the, um, uh, uh, you know, and the architecture people rise up and make their voices heard that the abolition and the, in many cases, suspension anyway, of, 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 the, uh, of the cultural curriculums within the schools was depriving children of the possibility of the, of the imagination, right? Which is what I said during my talk. They didn't do it. Why? Because they're all on grants. Because, they're, because some of them are being taken care of. Because they don't have a sense of solidarity. A number of reasons. But if they, you know, if you really look at the history in the United States in um, 1935, there was a Writers Congress and there was an Art Congress. People signed on to these Congresses. The WPA, the Works Projects Administration of the Roosevelt, uh, uh, of the Roosevelt uh, government, was prompted, not just by its uh, own lights, but prompted by the organization of artists and writers to establish grants for artists and writers. And I, I just have to tell you, I went to music and art high school in New York City. As you walked into music and art high school in 135th Street and Convent Dave, they now merged them, they call it Guardia High School. You saw a mural. And the first time I went in, I said, what's that mural? And one of the older students said, that mural was established by the WPA. Right in the middle of yeah, the mural. Post offices all over the country had murals done by artists like Raphael Sawyer, Moses Sawyer, Charles, right? I and mean, I can name the names. There was a proliferation of theater, which was dissolved by Congress because it was too red in 1938-39, and basically it never was revived. That is to say the notion that we, oh, and I, I, need I say that uh, some young whippersnapper named Orson Welles uh, established a, you know, the Mercury Theater within the WPA. And he was 
case, he was shut out. And he still survived. But the problem at this point is that we have accepted tacitly, not necessarily individually, but tacitly, collectively, we've accepted the idea that science and, and, and mathematics take precedence over the arts. Now, the science and mathematics that is part of the, uh, particularly the high school curriculum in the United States, is basically essentially rote learning. It is not based, uh, it is not conceptually based. It does not tell students why uh, geometry, why algebra, why trigonometry. What is the difference between Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry? Who was Ryman? Nobody knows who Ryman is in high school. The teachers don't know who Ryman is. Ryman, by the way, was the founder of non-Euclidean um, um, geometry, which was the basis as anybody who studies physics knows, of um, uh, quantum mechanics and, and the theory of relativity. You could not have done it without Ryman geometry. But none of these concepts are part of the program. The program is to regiment children, regiment young people, to conceptions of science and mathematics which are essentially uh, handed down from the top as received wisdom. And so you could even do a critique of the curriculum for science and, 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 and mathematics without denying its importance, but that wasn't even done very much. I, of course, I mean, I, not of course, but I've written a book called Science is Power, in which I have actually done that critique. But, you know, it, and it does well, it has sold, it's still in print, published in 1988, but it's still not in the daily practice of even the people in the arts or of the sciences. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm going to take this back a little bit. I'm not a doctor. I'm like, trying to get my doctorate. I'm an undergrad student here, and I am a science major, so I'm picking up what you're pitching. Um, what advice would you give to the millennial generation people that are in this room, which is three of us? In the, in the millennial generation? Yes. That's a three of us. Question. That, aside from being a science major and voraciously reading, what advice would you give for us to succeed in this jobless world? As a parent of a member of the millennial generation, I've had to give advice, not just to her, but to her friends. I have urged her and her friends to create their own, well, she's a journalist. She's a good writer, she's very smart. And she's working, you know, Atlantic Monthly, The Nation, NBC News, but as a freelancer. And so she works for, you know, she writes a 4,000 piece, a 4,000 word piece for a, uh, takes her a whole week and they pay her 500 bucks, you know, that kind of crap. Not everybody, but some people in that generation who see the situation coldly and understand that even if they personally get full -time, can get full-time jobs, that that's not in the cards for the generation are going to have to create their own institutions. They're going to have to do what Occupy did, but not necessarily by occupying, but they're going to have to create their own institutions that publish their own stuff, that have their own um, uh, um, uh, magazines, their own uh, um, play, uh, plays, uh, their own uh, music groups and so on. They're just going to have to realize that they're going to, if they don't create the alternative institutions, that they're going to be sunk. They're going to end up being reintegrated into the society without having their creativity paid any attention to. And there have been some attempts. I know she was part of a magazine called Good Magazine. She was on the staff for a bit. Um, it was not a bad magazine, but I mean, that was a, a millennial pro project. And w without talking only about the arts or literature or stuff like that, some of them will have to also create community groups organization groups, unemployment councils, underemployment councils that begin to make demands on the establishment that are demands for, what, what, what do you think? Guaranteed income. 
we have a situation now where we have trillions of dollars on the people, on the rich people's mattresses. Well, they're in the banks, but you know, the rich people's mattresses. They have to demand a piece of that action without the requirement that they go out and look for stinky jobs. That's a very, very difficult thing to get across. Without a program of guaranteed income and alternative institutions, then the problem of full employment becomes absolutely impossible. At the same time, you know, they should demand full employment. And to realize that that full employment is not going to take place primarily in the, in the private sector, the new jobs will have to be created by various government institutions and agencies. But that's not going to happen because the top decides to do it. It's going to happen because there's a, there's a, a, a grassroots, bottom-up series of not only protests and, and, and uh, resistances, but they're going to have to create the, the, uh, the, the, the programs themselves, the, the proposals that make those jobs meaningful and not just crap. Maybe it won't happen, but if it doesn't happen, then it ain't going to happen. So oh, I guess that's it, huh? Or oh, somebody else. Um, I'm also an undergrad and I'm looking into education. Um, and I graduated from high school with a public. I'm going to have to get closer. Oh, okay. Um, I graduated from high school. Okay, well, I went through the public high school education from the city of Worcester. And um, I saw a lot of um, earnest teachers um, try to get these students who weren't really involved with their education involved. And a lot of times there was actually resistance from the parents. So I was just wondering, what's, what, how is a teacher supposed to work with parents who don't care about their child's education? I mean, I don't even want to say like don't care, but just aren't as enthusiastic about it. but I think most parents care about their children. Yeah, most parents really care, but they don't know what to do. And when you say to parents, you can do something, there's several things you can do. One is you can demand at the school that a real education takes place. But you can't do that individually. You have to do that collectively. Maybe you join the PTA. Maybe you uh, form a, a different kind of organization. The second part of that question is exactly what I said before, but although it's very difficult given the fact that men and women are both working, there's nobody in the house half the time. And, that, and, young, and young kids get kept in line by having the television on all the time. They have to themselves get involved in education, their own education. They have to care enough about their own education to be caring about their child's education. Part of the problem is, that, that, that learning is now, we, we think that once we graduate high school or graduate college, we've stopped, our learning is now up to the media or up to uh, our specialty and so on. It's not true. There's a concept which is an old concept which I think hasn't been sufficiently explored, which is called lifelong learning. Lifelong learning, by the way, really means that you become habituated to reading. You become habituated to, to going to, you know, uh, museums or going to, or studying architecture, doing something like that. Lifelong learning is a way of life. And what we don't have in this country, or at least we have very little of it, the intellect is a way of life. And it doesn't matter whether you're a working class person or a middle class person or a professional, you, I come out of a family where the intellect was a way of life. That was my example. And those people worked, you know, 40 hours a week. My father got up at 6 o'clock in, in the morning and went to work uh, building tunnels. But he still came home and read to me poetry. I was four years old. He was reading Edgar Allan Poe. I was scared to death. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was... I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, you know. Uh, and I got older, he read to me Annabelle Lee, but that was a little better. <laughs> but, but the Raven, 
the raven, uh, at the age of four, you can imagine what the raven is at the age of four if you know something about literature. But still, that became a, a habit. And when my children were young, three of them, I sang to them all the time, every night. And I read to them every night, and so did their mother. It's a different way of life. And you have to encourage people that way because it's not simply you get a job or you're not going to get a job. Or you will get a job, but it won't be interesting anyway. It is a, it is, it's pleasurable. It's empowering. It gives you perspectives that you never dreamed of before. That's what it's about. Not getting a goddamn job. Stanley, thank you for your inspirational and, and intellectually challenging talk this evening. Um, we're